Welcome to my channel. This is Captain Binoy Varagil, Assistant Professor, Department of English, St. Joseph's College, Dev Greek Code Court. We are in the lecture series on Longinus Treaty on the Sublime. This is, in fact, the fifth lecture on on the Sublime. We had previously four lectures, and in those lectures, we discussed uh, the treaty on the Sublime. We had an introduction to the treaty. Then we define the concept of a sublime and thereafter we just uh, looked at the biographical details of uh, Longinus and uh, we uh, went for a very detailed analysis of chapters 7, 8 and 9 and in lecture 4 we discussed the five sources of sublimity that is in chapter 8 of uh, the treaty on the sublime and uh, we know that the five uh, sources of a sublime are grandeur of thought, capacity for strong emotion, appropriate use of figures, nobility of diction, dignity of composition or happy synthesis of all the preceding gifts. Uh, this is what we discussed in the previous lectures and today we just uh, begin our uh, fifth lecture in this series and in this lecture we come to the ninth chapter of the treaty on the sublime and the ninth chapter as you see in the slide is titled natural greatness and this lecture the fifth lecture in this series is on uh, the five sources of sublimity this is in fact a very detailed discussion of the five sources of sublime and we will begin our detailed discussion of uh, the five sources of sublime after a reading of uh, the uh, chapter 9. Ch chapter 9 is titled Natural Greatness and this chapter is about the first uh, source of sublime that is grandeur of thought, grandeur of thought, natural greatness uh, okay, uh, every uh, writers or uh, uh, writers who, who produce sublime literature, sublime uh, art will probably have uh, greatness. They will have greatness and uh, uh, greatness or grandeur of thought, great thought, great ideas. Uh, this is something that a writer or an artist get by birth or innately and that is the first source of uh, sublime we know that there are five sources and these five sources can be broadly classified into two that is uh, sources we get by birth or uh, innately and uh, they are two grandeur of thought and capacity for strong emotion these two sources we get by birth or innately and the remaining three sources we can acquire by practice by training and uh, in, in, in short we can say that we can just uh, classify the five sources of sublime into two sources that we get by birth by nature or natural sources and uh, sources we get by art that is of course acquirable sources and the natural sources or sources we get by birth are grandeur of thought, capacity for strong emotion and uh, sources we just uh, 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 acquire by training or practice is appropriate use of figures, nobility of diction and dignity of composition. So we will discuss all this in detail. Before that, let's just come to the first uh, uh, section of chapter 9 which is titled natural greatness so grandeur of thought great thought great ideas come to great men and all men are not great so that is what uh, Longinus speaks to us in this chapter please re let's read the beginning of chapter 9 now since the first of these factors that is to say natural greatness plays the most important part of them all here too even though it is a gift rather than an acquired characteristic we should do all we can to train our minds 
towards greatness, perpetually impregnating them, so to speak, with noble thoughts. By what means, you will ask, is this to be done? Well, I have written elsewhere to this effect, sublimity is the echo of a noble mind. Thus, even without being spoken, a simple idea will sometimes of its own accord excite admiration by reason of its nobility. For example, the silence of Ajax in the calling up of the dead is grand, more sublime than any words. First, then it is absolutely necessary to indicate the source of this power and to show that the truly eloquent man must have a mind that is not mean or ignoble. For it is not possible for those whose thoughts and habits are mean and servile throughout their lives to produce anything that is remarkable or worthy of immortal fame. No, greatness of speech is the province of those whose thoughts are deep, and this is why the lofty expression come naturally to the most high-minded men. Alexander's reply to Parmenio when he said, I would have been content. So here uh, Longinus speaks to us about the first source of sublimity, that is grandeur of thought. And we, we understand from this, these two paragraphs in the treaty that nobody can produce a sublime work unless his thoughts are sublime. For sublimity is the echo of greatness of soul. I repeat, sublimity is the echo of greatness of soul. It's impossible for those whose whole lives are full of mean and servile ideas and habits to produce anything that is admirable and worthy of an immortal life. It's only natural that great accents should fall from the lips of those whose thoughts have always been deep and full of majesty. So this is very important. Okay, sublimity or sublime literature, sublime poetry, sublime art can come only from people who have greatness, natural greatness, okay? And uh, a stately thoughts belong to the loftiest minds. And uh, these stately thoughts are innate, okay? So greatness, great ideas, and uh, great, great, uh, a mind, great soul, great values is innate, a natural condition of the writer's mind and heart, but they can also be acquired by a proper discipline, chiefly by dwelling constantly on whatever is noble and sublime and by emulating the example of great masters. Okay, so we understand that the first source uh, that is grandeur of thought or natural greatness is something that is innate still okay with practice of course maybe people can acquire uh, some some greatness right there is of course greatness in them but uh, their greatness can be just uh, uh, increased by a, a rigorous attempt and practice right so there is a close resemblance here between Longinus and Milton Milton also believed that if anyone wanted to be a great poet, he owed himself to be a true poem. So this concept of Longinus is uh, emphatically asserted by uh, our great poet Milton. Milton also says that only great people can produce great poetry, great literature. So uh, Milton believed that if anyone wanted to be a great poet, he owed himself to be a true poem. That is a composition and pattern of the best and honorable thought things. Okay, so this is the first source of sublime, that is grandeur of thought, natural greatness. Okay, so by birth, innately, uh, a poet, a writer, an artist has to be great. He should have great values, 
great ideas and uh, great great thoughts and uh, with this resource or uh, source he can produce of course great literature great poetry great art that is uh, uh, a, a very very distinct kind of literature and art now we come to the second source of uh, sublimity and uh, okay uh, second source of sublimity as we understand is capacity for strong emotion okay and uh, Longinus is asserting the fact that nobody can make great literature great poetry great art great music uh, unless and until he or she is having a capacity for strong emotion okay so uh, maybe we come across a lot of poets and writers and artists and musicians and of course great men who contributed through art literature poetry and all and we understand that they are very emotional very very sensitive very emotional they can of course know the feelings of others very easily uh, at this uh, context of course uh, it's good that we remember what uh, uh, Wordsworth uh, said about poetry rather uh, the, the romantic definition of poetry he says that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful emotions recollecting in tranquility so we see a lot of similarities between that definition of William Wordsworth and uh, the very uh, concept of Longinus. Longinus is asserting the fact that the second source of sublimity is capacity for strong emotion. It's very, very simple and easy to understand. In fact, this section is missing in the Treaty on the Sublime. But when we go through each and every chapter there are scattered remarks that Longinus believed of emotions as an important factor in sublimity and uh, we have a quotation from the treaty uh, in, in which uh, Longinus says I would confidently affirm that nothing makes so much for grandeur as true emotion in the right place for it inspires the words as it were with a wild gust of mad enthusiasm and fills them with divine frenzy so this is very very important right that is um, sublime literature sublime poetry sublime art can be produced by uh, men uh, who have capacity for strong emotion okay so uh, look at any any of the greatest literary works of uh, the world no matter whether it is fiction or poetry or drama we will come across uh, a, a poetry or sections of poetry or drama or novel which is very very emotional and uh, uh, and, and that emotion okay uh, is the emotion the the poet or the author the writer felt when he wrote that and because he has that strong capacity for emotion the very emotion of the poet is transferred to the reader or the listener and uh, Longinus very very successfully asserts the fact that sublime literature sublimity is uh, uh, resulting from capacity for strong emotion so with that we come to the end of the discussion of uh, the second source of sublime sublimity or sublime that is capacity for strong emotion and we come to the third source of uh, sublime the third source of sublime is appropriate use of figures we know uh, figures refers to figures of speech there are of course a lot of stylistic uh, expressions in poetry uh, fiction uh, and, and literature right so all 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 we have so many figures of speech figures of speech like simile metaphor oxymoron synecdoche personification all right plenty of plenty of figures of speech and uh, the appropriate use of a simile in a poem or the appropriate use of a metaphor in, in, in a literary work. Say for example, when you read maybe the, the Booker Prize winning novel of Identity Roy, The God of Small Things, we have uh, 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 an incessant use of metaphors in, in the novel. 
Similarly, in great poetry, we have, uh, 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 of course, uh, 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 thousands or right, uh, maybe plenty of uh, 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 very, very apt figures of speech, similes. Okay, my love is a red rose. All right, uh, that is a metaphor. My love is a red rose. Okay, similarly, you have uh, so many, so many uh, figures of speech and Longinus is asserting the fact that appropriately the art of the artistic aids to sublimity the figures of speech occupy the largest space nearly one third of the treaty and on the sublime the text or maybe I uh, yeah like uh, you read right now one third of this treaty is about uh, the figures of speech and now when uh, when we read the uh, text uh, the treaty we understand that Longinus speaks uh, mainly about four figures of speech and the uh, main chief figures of speech Longinus mentions are the rhetorical question and uh, asyndeton, uh, hyperbaton and periphrasis. So these are the four uh, chief figures of speech Longinus mentioned in the treaty on the sublime. Let's just understand uh, what these figures of speech are. So let's just look at uh, uh, what the rhetorical speech, uh, rhetorical question is, right? Everybody knows what a rhetorical question is, all right? We know that rhetorical question, okay, it, it is either a statement in question uh, form, okay? So we have a statement uh, which is used as a question that suggests its own answer or a rapid succession of questions and answers that is rhetorical question say for example politicians depend on these figures figure of speech often they'll be asking you questions like don't you know what happened in 1947 right okay similarly don't you know what happened in uh, uh, 1947 don't you know what happened in uh, uh, 2013 okay so they don't give you the answer like what happened in 1947 or rather 1857 okay we know what happened all right but uh, the rhetorical question is making the uh, very very speech of the speaker or the very context of uh, the poem all the more significant okay so what is a rhetorical question a rhetorical question is either a statement in question form that suggests its own answer or a rapid succession of questions and answers, right? And uh, next, Lajainas uh, speaks about asyndeton. Asyndeton. What is asyndeton? Asyndeton is a speech, a figure of speech in which words or clauses which should be ordinarily connected by conjunctions are left unconnected as uh, maybe in right. Uh, so, uh, 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 you you have in fact uh, uh, a, a maybe three four uh, adjectives or nouns or verbs. So normally these adjectives, nouns or verbs should be connected with conjunctions, right? Or or connectives. Okay. But uh, the speaker is speaking with uh, maybe uh, maybe so much of emotion. Rather he is very very overwhelmed by the emotions and he doesn't uh, wait to use the uh, connectives or conjunctions and uh, we see that uh, these conjunctions are just uh, 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 not used or other you have of course a number of verbs or nouns or adjectives just unconnected and that is the uh, figure of speech uh, which is known as uh, asyndeton. Then we have the third figure of speech that is hyperbation. Okay, so hyperbation is an inversion of the normal order of words suggestive of a disordered utterance made under an emotional strain and uh, telling with a like effect on the hearer or reader. So um, we have a very good example in Shakespeare's uh, Macbeth. Okay, so in Macbeth, when Macduff uh, 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 comes at the ap uh, appointed hour to call on Duncan and finds 
uh, King Duncan lying dead in a pool of blood in his bed chamber, only broken words can fall from his lips. That, however, explains his bewilderment more effectively than if they had followed their normal order. So, now that uh, Macduff is so shocked by the scene of uh, uh, the, 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 the dead body of King Duncan, that he doesn't just utter things in the normal order. He's, he utters things in maybe a very, very, uh, maybe, yeah, there, there's a, a reverse or rather an inversion of the normal order of words. And this is what is known as hyperbaton. Hyperbaton. Say, for example, uh, this is what Macduff utters in uh, Macbeth. Oh, horror, horror, horror. Tongue nor heart cannot conceive nor name thee. So here, look at that. Horror, horror, horror. Tongue nor heart cannot conceive nor name thee. So in fact, he uses the noun tongue initially and later heart. So tongue cannot name thee. Heart cannot conceive thee is the normal order. But he doesn't utter in that order. He is using it in a different way. And it goes like tongue cannot conceive, heart cannot name thee. So this is in fact uh, hyperbaton where the speaker is just uh, 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 right, uh, going for an expression in which there is an inversion of the normal order of words. Okay. That is hyperbaton. And Longinus says that this can, of course, make a literary work all the more uh, distinct and great. And this is, of course, uh, the source of uh, sublimity. That is, uh, all right, the appropriate use of figures of speech. Now we come to the fourth main figure of speech Longinus mentioned, that is periphrasis. What is periphrasis? Periphrasis is a kind of... Uh, utterance it's a kind of it's it's in fact a roundabout way of speaking roundabout way of speaking right you you cannot speak it straight straight away you cannot speak it bluntly you cannot speak it in an open way but you want to speak and you just speak it in a round uh, 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 about way and that is periphrasis right say for example all right you don't want to say uh, that um, Mm, you you are you don't want to say uh, that, that uh, uh, maybe you don't want to use the word woman all right so instead of using the word woman or a girl or uh, yeah or or a lady what what would you say you would say fair sex so fair sex is uh, an example for periphrasis right because you do not want to say uh, woman you use fair sex or you do not want to say, you do not want to use the word wife. And instead of using the word wife, what do you say? You say better half, better half. All right. So this is, this is periphrasis. Similarly, you have other expressions. And we have a very good example in Shakespeare's Othello. In Shakespeare's Othello, we have uh, Desdemona. Desdemona is a wife of Othello and uh, Othello is suspicious of Desdemona and and, and, and and Othello calls her a whore or a prostitute. But Desdemona is so noble and that that she, she comes from such a, an aristocratic, noble, uh, good family that she, she doesn't want to use the word uh, uh, a whore or, or a prostitute because uh, she thinks that it is not good of her to use that word, and she just speaks in a roundabout way. Look at look at the context, right? In fact, what happens is Desdemona and Emilia. Emilia is the confidant or companion of uh, Desdemona, all right? And uh, uh, Desdemona and Emilia are are complaining to Iago. Iago is of course the villain, right? And uh, uh, we have uh, the dialogue. Uh, Desdemona, uh, Des Desdemona is just uh, using a periphrasis. Uh, this is the quotation I'm quoting from or the law of Shakespeare. This is Desdemona. Am I of that name, Iago? Look at that. Am I of that name? She doesn't want to say, am I, am I a whore? Am I a prostitute? But she's asking, 
Am I of that name, Iago? And Iago, what name, fair lady? Iago doesn't know which, which name, which word Othello used. Othello called Desdemona a whore. And Desdemona cannot use that word whore because she is from a noble uh, family. Her upbringing, her education, her nobility doesn't let her use that. And she's using periphrasis or roundabout kind of expression. And she's asking, am I of that name, Iago? Iago, what name, fair lady? Desdemona, look at, this is it. Desdemona, such as she says, my lord did say I was. Such as she says, who says, Emilia says, or the lost wife. My Lord did say I was, and uh, that is, of course, a whore. All right. So this kind of uh, roundabout uh, 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 expression or way of speaking is what is periphrasis. And uh, uh, according to Longinus, the fourth source of sublimity is appropriate use of figures of speech. And uh, he is just pointing out the chief figures of speech. Number one, rhetorical question. Number two, ascendaton. Number three, hyperbaton. And number four, periphrasis. And now, let, let's look at the fourth uh, source of uh, sublimity. That is, nobility of diction. It's very easy to understand because we discussed Aristotle. We, we, we discussed, of course, the poetic. We know what, what diction is. Nobility of diction is nothing. It refers to, of course, the proper choice of words and use of metaphors and ornamental language. So we have prose and verse. Prose and verse are, di are different. Poetry is written in a very ornate, decorated, beautiful language. All right. So uh, nobility of diction refers to the very, very choice of words. Okay. Every poet, every writer is very, very selective and he ensures that the very word he uses cannot be replaced by another word. That is nobility of diction. Okay, appropriate choice of words, proper words has to be there, have to be used. And that we find in great poetry in any language, no matter whether it is Spanish or English or, uh, or, or French or Italian or Malayalam. Okay. We have the appropriate and, and we see that these lines cannot be just replaced by another. Say, for example, look at Shakespeare in Hamlet. Uh, we have the great soliloquy of Hamlet to be or not to be. That's the question whether it's noble in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles. All right. No word can be replaced. That is nobility of diction. Similarly, in our Macbeth. Life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. It's a walking shadow. Look at that. It cannot be right. Not a word can be replaced. Similarly, any poetry, just uh, maybe you, you, you read your Robert Frost writer. You have the beautiful poem, Stopping by the Woods on a Snowy Evening, uh, in which you read uh, lines like this. My lady host must think it cure to... Stop without a farmhouse near. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sound is the sweep of the wind. And all right, look at that. Each and every word is apt. All right, the woods are lovely, dark and deep. But I have promises to keep miles to go before I sleep. Miles to go before I sleep. This is great poetry. This is great poetry because of nobility of diction, and. In 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 uh, or in Vikurup or in Sukhda Kumari or in uh, in in Ullur or in Vailopulli Sridhar Menon or Kunjan Nambiar or any of, of the great poets you you see nobility of diction. Anjida magina shuddha jalangalil nanjidu anai vandhuru ningal nanjaga mandu kallu shiva shiva panja mahapadagi marni ningal look at that. Anjida magina shuddha jalangalil nanjidu anai vandhuru ningal. Not even a single word can be replaced by another one. Kalatamuchikim andikim ravilum kalend and vanmaruka yadade. Ayar through mulatilanyan you were tundundaya the hutspanda vedimakum. Look at that. Every word is specially chosen and 
the proper choice of words and the use of metaphors and ornamental languages, nobility of diction, and Longinus asserts the fact that a work is sublime only if there is nobility of diction. And with that, we come to the end of uh, the discussion of the fourth source of sublime, and now we come to the fifth source of sublime, that is dignity of composition. What, what is dignity of composition? Dignity of composition refers to the arrangement of words, right? Line one to the last line, paragraph one to the last paragraph, chapter one, first paragraph, first sentence, that is similarly last chapter, last paragraph, last sentence dignity of composition refers to the arrangement of words it should be the one that blends thought emotion figures and words into a harmonious whole so it it is applicable in the case of plays drama it's applicable in the case of poetry it's true in the case of uh, novel it's true in the case of uh, short story okay the way a story is written last leaf of O. Henry, all right, or diamond necklace, or higuita, or uh, maybe biryani of Sandosh Echikana, all right, or it can, it can even be novels, novels like Pride and Prejudice, okay, or uh, maybe, yeah, I often say, got a small things, right, okay, all uh, right, uh, every sentence, every paragraph, every chapter, Everything is so beautifully constructed that you would just uh, 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 read it again and again. That is dignity of composition, the arrangement of words, right? So um, this is, of course, the fifth source of sublimity. And it, uh, 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 Longinus says that, uh, right, uh, 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 dignity of composition, right, that is writing, writing something. Uh, it, it should be a, a kind of great arrangement. It should be an arrangement and uh, such an arrangement has not only a natural power of persuasion and of giving pleasure, but also the marvelous power of exalting the soul and swaying the heart of men. When you read, you are moved. You are moved. Okay, Aruangumi, Naruangumi, Aramatin, the Romanjam, Iprabada, Vilasa Lodama, Suprabada, Tin Susmida. Look at that. Beautiful. Ravile Guli Chambalatil Toran, Povadina, Yurungi, Shanananan, Nidankail, Punin Taligil, Minio to Pudu Paninir Pukar. Turning and turning in the winding gyre, the folk and cannot hear the folk nor things fall apart, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. I wander lonely as a cloud. Like, look at that. All these poetry or story or fiction confirm or affirm or assert the fact that dignity of composition is essential for sublime work. It's essential for sublime work. Look at Shelley's Ode to the Wild West Wind. O Wild West Wind, thou breath of autumn's being, thou from whose uh, presence the dead leaves are driven like ghosts from an enchanted fleeing. Look at that, beautiful. Okay, so uh, 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 dignity of composition or uh, best kind of arrangement of words can just persuade the reader, not only persuade the reader, can also give pleasure to the reader. And Longinus uh, asserts the fact that sublimity uh, uh, can be enhanced with dignity of composition and uh, we know that sublimity is a distinction and excellence in writing in in literature and in art so with this we come to the end of lecture number five and uh, in lecture we have one more lecture in this series that is lecture number six lecture number six we will be looking at uh, the more significant concepts uh, or rather We'll be looking at the value of Longinus' criticism and we will also discuss uh, Longinus is considered a romanticist. Rather, we have the British critic uh, Scott James. Scott James considers Longinus 
the first romantic critic so we will be in the next lecture lecture number uh, six will be looking at uh, 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 longinus as a romanticist and uh, we will also be just discussing the value of uh, uh, longinus criticism thanks a lot for listening the end of lecture number five may god bless you